Okay, today is July the 14th, 2008. My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University Library and we're doing an oral history project called Women of the Oklahoma Legislature. And today I'm with Rebecca Hamilton in her office at the State Capitol. And she served in, has served twice, two different, two different time periods, about 20 years apart, right? About 16 years apart. They elected in 1980 and served through 86. Six. Mm -hmm. and then elected again in 2002 and currently serving mm -hmm. right that's correct thank you for having me today oh, you're welcome and let's start by having you tell a little bit about uh, your childhood where you were born siblings and then we'll move forward well actually i was born in my district i was uh we'll just start that over okay i was born in my district in south oklahoma city and i grew up there I lived there basically all my life. Um, my father was a mechanic at Armors, and then when that plant closed, he uh, got a job with the city, and then uh, shortly, a few years after that, he went to work at the stockyards in my district. So uh, he actually worked in my district. My mother was a waymaster at the stockyards in my district, so I'm really part of my district, part of my area. Um, I went graduated from Capitol Hill High School, Jackson. We called it Junior High then, Caps, uh, Jackson Junior High and Capitol Hill High School. And um, I have, I guess that's, you know, those are the highlights of my childhood. No siblings? Oh yes, I have one <laughs> sister, Brookie. She is three and a half years younger than me. And is she in the end of politics? No, <laughs> no, she's not. Well, in high school, were you, re were you interested in, in the political arena that early? A little bit. I got involved in a political campaign when I was 15, I think. One of my teachers was running for office. And a lot of us um, volunteered to help him. And I went out one Saturday and put flyers on doors, knocked on people's doors and said, hello, I'm here for this person and, and uh, handed them the flyer. And then did a, uh, a thing where he drove us all around a pickup and we yelled his name out. And <laughs> <laughs> that was my initial political involvement. And then come 1980s, are you thinking about it or how, how did your first well, I got involved in the women's movement in the 70s. I was very active in the women's political caucus. Mm -hmm. I was the state treasurer, and I was on the finance committee of the National Pol Women's Political Caucus. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a big push to try to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment here in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And the man who represented the district where I live was... I don't want to say anything bad about someone, but he, he was opposed to the Equal Rights Amendment and he was kind of ugly with some of the people, the women who came up here to lobby for it. And they were personally hurt by what he said. And they didn't know I lived in his district and they were looking for someone for years and couldn't find anybody. And I just, in a chance remark, said, oh, well, I live there. And they were just all over me trying to get me to run. And I said no for months and then finally decided, well, okay, I can do that. And so I did. I, I didn't know anything about what I was getting into. And I had some people try to warn me that it was not pleasant running for office and that I was going to be called horrible names and I would be stunned by what people would say about me that I I thought oh that's no big deal when it happened I learned it was <laughs> it does hurt when people say these things uh, he I lost that election that was in 1978 and I lost that election by 21 votes oh, gosh. and so at that point I was determined to run again um, I, I do that uh, I'm, that's just the way I react to defeat. And I was just absolutely determined that I was going to run again and I was going to win, which I did in 2000. I mean, I'm sorry, 1980. I get all my elections mixed up. <laughs> in 1980. And so I was elected in 1980. And as you mentioned, I served from 80 to 86. So in 80, you won against an incumbent? Mm -hmm. 16 year incumbent. 
And did you, who was your campaign manager at that second time? I've always managed my own yeah. campaigns. Do you have a particular strategy? Uh, I have a whole set of strategies. I learned how to run for office in the race that I lost. Okay. Uh, learning and losing is actually very, very good for you in the long run. It, it hurts a whole lot when you do it, but it's a great learning experience. And uh, the, the basic strategy, I guess you could say, that I use is to be as, to, well, I work with the district. I don't concern myself with uh, special interest groups or with people outside the district. I look at what the people that I'm going to represent need and what they want, and what they care about. And since I grew up there, it's not any big stretch for me because I'm one of them. I want the same things. I care about the same things. I, I do care about these people. And so it's easy for me to represent them. But that's what I do with my campaigns is I focus on my people in my district. I have a slogan. It changes every time. The, I think the first time I was elected, it was put Hamilton in the house, which is pretty goofy. And uh, when I came back in 2002, it was, uh, she's not just one of the boys, I think, or something like that, because I had two opponents at that time and they were both men. Mm -hmm. She's not just one of the good old boys. That was my slogan. So in that race, were you up against an incumbent as well? No, no, it was an open seat. Um, but the two opponents were good opponents. They were both very well, they had all the support, not me. And that difference in time had campaigning and changed quite a bit from the 80s to the 2000s? Not too much, not in the little races. I think that the big difference is that uh, the computers, you now have computers. And when I ran in 1980, everything was by hand. We ordered um, mailing lists, we ordered labels from a computer company in 1980, but other than that, we kept all of our records by hand. We did everything. I had big three ring binders, great, those big ones, those five inch three ring binders that I kept records of every voter contact and uh, everything, but everything we did was by hand. Uh, F, and, and that took an army of volunteers. When I came back in 2002, everything's by computer, and I could do that myself. And so uh, the big difference is that you don't need nearly as many volunteers to run a campaign with computers doing so much of the work. That's good and bad. I mean, the, the, there are, the involvement of the volunteers is um, losing that does somewhat diminish the power of democracy, unfortunately, I think. That's odd if that was it. Yeah, it makes money more important mm -hmm. and people less important. Mm -hmm. And that's not really good. Mm -hmm. Well, your, the first election, not, not the one you lost, but the second one, I guess. Uh, do you remember your campaign the night of the election? <laughs> oh, yes. Watch party or whatever might uh -huh. be going on? Yeah. Oh, well, there was a huge crowd there because, as I said, I had to have a lot of of volunteers and I had a tremendous amount of help from people in the women's movement and uh, at that time I was I, I've done a big change on one issue and that's abortion and when I was elected in 1980 in the 1970s I had been the state director of NARAL I was extremely pro-choice and so I had a lot of people who were there uh, I think almost everybody was actually there because of ERA at that point because that's where the big push was. Mm -hmm. I, I actually didn't get much help from pro-choice people. I mean, they, they liked me, but they didn't do much for me. It was the ERA people who were there. But I, I, there was a big crowd there and um, it was fun. I, I've tried winning, I've tried losing. Winning is a whole lot better. <laughs> it definitely is better. How about your first swearing in ceremony? I, uh, you know, I don't remember that as well. Uh, I do remember it. I have photos, and I look like such a kid, and and I have all these friends who are there with me, and they all look so young. And um, I was so broke. This is kind of an interesting story. I was so broke. You know, I really am from my district, and my district has the lowest income level of any district in the state. And I was so broke. I didn't have a any money to buy any clothes to be sworn in with. 
And so a friend of mine took me out and bought me a suit so that I would have something to wear to my swearing in ceremony. So that that was kind of neat, actually. That wasn't bad. That was good. Do you still have it? Yes. Yes. And I still have her. She's mm -hmm. still my friend. Mm -hmm. When you walked into the capital that first day, I guess maybe every day, though, do you have a certain you know, sense or feeling when you... I was, I was a real kid back in 1980, and I walked in here with a bunch of my friends, and I said, where's the house? <laughs> because I didn't know. <laughs> and the, the guy looked at me and he said, ma'am, he said, you've got to go upstairs. And it was really very firm of it. He said, you, you don't go in here. You go upstairs. And I said, no, no, I'm, I'm a representative. <laughs> you've got to let me in. <laughs> My friends teased me about that for a long time. You know, where's the house? <laughs> and when I was first elected, I had uh, people, it took a while for people, that was before there had been many women mm -hmm. in the legislature. We were kind of a novelty back then. Mm -hmm. And they tried to give me things to Xerox and they tried to uh, give me, to ask me to go get them coffee and, and all sorts of things. And uh, that never bothered me or offended me, but it certainly embarrassed them. Uh, <laughs> they, I always thought it was kind of funny, and uh, but it really embarrassed them. But back then, we didn't even have a, a ladies' restroom. They they just made one for us outside the house, out of a storage room, and uh, it was pretty bad. <laughs> well, it wasn't bad, but it was unusual. It was it was actually kind of fun. Well, did anyone take you under their wing? Oh, yes. Yes. Or at least try. Yes, I had tremendous help. Uh, Representative Mike Fair was, uh, he's a Republican, but he was tremendous help with me. Um, I had uh, Representative Charles Gray was a big help. Most of the other representatives from South Oklahoma City tried to help me. Um, Frank Sheridan, representative, he was a representative then, he later became a senator, and so did Mike Fair, he became a senator later. They both tried to help me. Uh, I remember my, um, of course I met my husband here, okay. and he didn't exactly take me under his wing, but we certainly formed an alliance, I would say. We've been married a quarter of a century, <laughs> raised two kids. But uh, I remember my first bill, was a bill legalizing it um, made rape by instrumentation against the law, which had not been illegal before. And it um, legalized rape, espousal rape. I mean, made it illegal for a man to rape his wife. I'll get this right here in a minute. Well, that's kind of a bombshell to put out. Um, back then, those were really controversial ideas, very much so. And so I talked to the different legislators about it, and they were all men that I was talking to about it, and said, I don't know what to do, and I'm scared to go, and I was. I was you don't know what it's like standing up on that floor. Uh, people tend to, there's a world of difference between watching a car wreck and being in one, <laughs> and standing up on that floor is a lot different when you're actually the one holding that mic. It is scary. And they all come at you, ask you questions. I mean, they, they can really make you look like a fool, which is something most people fear a great deal. And um, I told them, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know. And so the, we sat up here one night late trying to figure out how to help me pass that bill. And what we did, and I've never told anyone this, this is, but I don't think he would mind now. Uh, I had another bill doing something or the other. I don't remember what. And they were both out on the floor. And Frank Sheridan said, well, what we'll do is we will amend, I'm going to amend your bill to put my uh, castration bill in it. And then there's going to be this huge fight. And he said, and then you run your uh, bill making spousal rape against the law right after that. And they'll be so exhausted from the fight over the... <laughs> over the castration bill, they'll just pass it and never even notice what they've done. And there were about four or five of us who were involved in this genius plan, and that's exactly what we did, and it worked. It worked. And it worked. And getting the through, uh, when I got the thing through the house, I couldn't find a Senate offer to save myself. They would not touch it. 
and uh, finally Frank Keating stepped up. I'll never forget that. He, um, he was a senator at that time. And I had been through everybody in both parties. And uh, I went to Frank, and he said, I'll st I still remember this because this was my first bill and I was a scared kid. And he said, of course I'll help you. What you're doing is right, and it needs to be done. And yes, I will help you. And I have never, ever forgotten that about Frank Keating. And so, anyway, yeah, I had a lot of help. Has it gotten any easier to do bills on the floor? No, it's much harder now. Yeah. Oh, you mean handling things yeah. on the mic and stuff? Yeah. Uh, yes, it's easier. I know what to do. It's always scary when you stand up. You never know what's going to happen on that floor. And But no, I don't get petrified before I handle a bill on the floor anymore, if that's what you're asking. Have you had any other bills that are just... I'll stick out those three ones you're proudest of. Well, uh, I was the original author of the protective order here in Oklahoma. It took me two years to pass that back in the day. And I, it, it, the major reason why is because it took me that long to get the chips <laughs> to pass it. Uh, that was a big coup. I mean, because th that was just unthinkable and to pass that here. And... Um, that, I guess, in my first, I, I also got this, I passed the hotline for rape victims here in Oklahoma. I uh, got the funding, it wasn't a piece of legislation, but I got the funding to set up the first statewide, it was five pilot programs around the state for adult daycare. And I did, uh, I was one of the people who worked on nursing home reform. And back then, nursing homes really, really, really needed reforming. Uh, then when I came back, I, I've done a lot of things, you know, in my second go-round that I'm really proud of, too. Uh, well, I was, as I, I remarked earlier, that I was pro-choice in my first time in office. Well, then I had a very powerful religious conversion. And when I, I came back, I was pro-life, which has been the source of a great deal of controversy surrounding me. But uh, as part of that process, I was the primary author of the uh, House Bill 1686 in um, 2005. That was the bill that broke the log jam. It was a 30-year log jam on pro-life legislation. And getting that through changed that. And uh, now a, a big part of that change was the Republican takeover of the House. It changed the climate quite a bit, too. Um, but there, there was, um, it took all of us. I think that's, that's something that people don't realize. If we desperately need both parties to be working together on things that matter and not trying to shoot each other down all the time. That's terrible for the people terrible for the country. Uh, I passed that. I Let's see, I passed a bill saying that uh, you couldn't put to write victims' private information on the internet, which I thought was very important. I passed a bill, um, I passed another pro-life bill. And both of these bills, these bills made it uh, required informed consent for abortion. They required parental consent for minors. They uh, required, um, the first bill said that if you murder a pregnant woman, you can be charged with the death of the baby as well as the death of the woman. Uh, then the second bill basically dealt with funding and some of those issues. I passed that. Uh, I, there again, that was actually Representative John Wright's bill. But in order to get it through, I had to author it at the, at the final thing. And that's an example of both parties working together. Um, I really don't know that I passed that bill. That was just my, I stepped in uh, when I needed to step in to get it through. Um, I passed a bill this year making it a crime to beat up a pregnant woman, which had only took me five years. Oh my God. <laughs> only took me five years. Um, so yes, I've done some things I'm proud of both times. You need to, need to stay in at least 12. Then. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a long time to pass things when you're talking about people that other people feel justified in doing things to. You can tell how much people's human rights are being uh, disregarded by how angry people become when you try to stand up for them. 
You can always tell. And uh, right now it's immigrants. Everybody hates immigrants and you can do anything you want to to them and if you stand up for them you become the object of a lot of the hatred that's directed toward them. It's uh, the unborn. If you do anything to stand up for the rights of unborn children then you're going to get really hit and it's always women. Always. I mean that it changes. When you've been in office as long as I have you see it change. Who It used to be black people. In the 80s, it was black people. It's not now. But now, I mean, now, you, I mean, you say something really racist now, and you're going to, if you wanted to say that, which I don't, but if you did, you'd be smacked down. But you can uh, do almost anything you want to certain groups of people. And it's like we've always got somebody we hate. And uh, right now, the number one everybody hates is immigrants. They're just not even like human beings. We want to deny them medical care. We want to deny them an education. We want to, you know, and those things are human rights, basic human rights. And, but it's always women. And it's not just here in Oklahoma. It's, you go right around this globe and it will always be women. I mean, there may be the Etah in Japan, there may be the Untouchables in India, there may be this and that and these and those, but it's always women. There are always women in addition to that, everywhere. And when the day comes where standing up for women doesn't get me in trouble, I'll know that we're making some progress. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. After this race this spring, seeing the sexism that came out in this election this spring, I'm wondering if we've made any progress at all. Now we have with people. It's the powers that be. I don't know if you noticed that, but the people were very willing to elect a woman for president. Mm -hmm. It was, in fact, the, the, the boys club had to run over the people to, get, <laughs> to keep from doing it. <laughs> So, yeah, it's, it's got a ways to go. Well, at least we have a, haven't had lieutenant governors. Yeah, and we have a wonderful lieutenant governor right now. And we have the one, Mary Fallon. Yes, she, she's a great lady, too. To I like her very much. Too. I like both of them. Well, you were, you were here pre-Dome and post-Dome. Do you have any comments about that one way or the other? Dome doesn't matter to me. <laughs> I don't care about the Dome. <laughs> Well, what would you consider your political philosophy? You've said some of it. Do you have anything else you want to add about that? Well, I think that my political philosophy now is different than it was. I didn't, wouldn't have said that I had a political philosophy at first. Um, to use this power that I have, you, you only have it for a while. And when you have it, it's almost like magic. I mean, you can make things happen when you've got REP in front of your name to use this power to do as much good for people as I can and to save as many lives as I can. Um, that would be my, that is what I try to do. Well, in your break between 96, uh, 86 and coming back, what prompted you to come back? <laughs> you know, I don't know. I, I, I seem to run for office without knowing why. <laughs> Uh, I found out that the guy that was leaving, the man who had had it before, Charles Gray, who's a friend of mine, uh, was leaving. And I, I really debated on, uh, filing is Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And it closes at 5 o'clock on Wednesday. I, on Tuesday, I was just driving everybody crazy trying to decide what to do. I drove my husband so nuts he went to bed, which is what he does. He just listens to me until he, he just gets tired. I talk, 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 talk when I'm doing making a decision. And he'd, he'd had it and he went to bed. So I called a friend of my, mine in California and talked to him until midnight, trying to decide what I should do. And I remember he said to me, he said, well, if you file, you will win. And I said, well, I, what I finally decided to do was file. And then I had until Friday to change my mind and withdraw. <laughs> and so I, um, I was actually that, 
unsure about what I wanted to do. And, and then, as usual, uh, people started coming at me, trying to make me leave the race, trying to make me, because they knew that I was, prob or I would guess, I, no one told me this, but I would guess that they knew that I was someone they needed to eliminate in any way they could. And once that started, I was in. Uh, once you start trying to push me around, I just, I just fight. I mean, that's, yeah, that's that's just, that's what always happens with me. You can you can be nice to me and get me just tumble and loosed out of everything. I mean, you can talk me out of anything by being nice to me, but you start fighting with me, and I will just fight right back at you. Well, in '86, you chose not to run again, right? Mm -hmm. I had a baby. So, I, I made one of the best decisions I ever made. Mm -hmm. I stayed home with my kids for 16 years. So once your 12 years is up, what do you think you'll do next? Oh, I don't know. Die, I guess. I'll be so old. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't foresee running for any other office. I'm, I'm writing a book right now, and we'll see if that, if that gets published. It may cause a lot of controversy because I'm actually, I'm talking about some of the same things that I've been talking about here in this interview, and that seems to cause a lot of people to get, upset and so it might or might not assuming it even gets published i don't know i don't have a publisher i'm just writing it i also want to do work for uh i want to i'm working i have incorporated and i need to advance a group called pro-life or oklahoma democrats for life and that's will be an affiliate of the national democrats for life of america and the whole purpose of that organization is not just abortion. It's about uh, all a, a, a consistent life ethic that takes, uh, we, we tend to try to splice life up and you've got one party saying, well, we're for life after birth. And then you've got this other party saying, well, we're for life before birth. And, and well, you know, maybe we need to look at it all and take care of it. And, and so that's what, I, this organization is about, and that's true on the national level too, is espousing, uh, electing pro-life Democrats, developing a pro-life voice within the Democratic Party, and working toward legislation that will enhance the basic human right to life of all human beings, from conception to natural death, and which is my belief. I mean, that's my concern, and uh, not pit one person's right to life against another the way we do with abortion. And so that's, I want to work on that organization and I have another organization that I'm starting as well. Now what will happen with any of that, you just do these things and then see what happens. Yeah. You may end up lobbying something. Oh, I don't like lo yeah. the thought of lobbying. If I did lobby, it would be for some cause. I'm not a hired gun. I don't have the temperament or the personality for that. Well, if some woman came up to you and asked you what your advice would be if she was thinking about running, what would, what would you tell her? Tell her to do it. We need women in office. Uh, you can't have a good government unless all the people are represented. And that means all the people, both men and women. Men cannot speak for women. They just, they try, and, and I'm not saying men are bad because they're not. I mean, I'm, I, I, the best people, some of the best people I know, the two I gave birth to are both men. <laughs> but the fact is, you can't speak from someone else's experience. You can only speak from your own. And for a government to be truly representative, it needs to have women in it. Also, women uh, have an emotional intelligence and a dynamic that men simply don't have. We're not just little guys with higher voices. We are the life bearers of the human race. And we have a tremendous amount of perspective that if you take it out of the public debate, uh, you, you lose so much that you don't ever get good government. Good government comes from having that perspective as well as the perspective that men bring. Mm -hmm. Um, the, just on a practical note, I don't think it would have taken five years to pass the uh, bill about beating up pregnant women, as a for instance, if the House had had 90 women and 11 men. Uh, I think it was, and I, 
and and this really makes these guys mad when I say this. <laughs> and I got in major trouble for saying this last spring, but it's just the truth. Uh, it's not that they are cold and cruel and uncaring. It's that it always falls to the bottom of the list. Now, some of them are cold and cruel and uncaring, but most of them are. There's, what, 18 other women right now? 16 or 17? There are about 11 women in the House, and then there, there's some women in the Senate. Six, okay. So have you guys did the stuff together after hours? We're trying to. The the partisanship up here has been very destructive. And it's destructive, first of all, to us as people. Uh, because we, we're in such a froth of hatred toward one another. And that's just not a healthy way to be. And it separates people unnecessarily. And it, then it's secondly, it's very destructive to our government. And it's ultimately very destructive to the people and to the country. Uh, so it is getting better. And it really was much better this year. And I, I do believe that was the change in speakers. I think Chris Binge is a much, is a very nice man. And, and I think that's why it got better. It is getting better, and I hope it continues to get better because we really need to understand that we're going to disagree about things because we are different people and we represent different constituencies mm -hmm. and I would be it would be an immoral thing for me to represent my district by voting the way well I wouldn't be representing my district for me to vote the way that the representative from Nichols Hills would vote because I would be doing things that would be harmful to the interest of the people that I represent, the people to whom this office really belongs. On the other hand, if he started voting the way I do, it would be immoral for him. It would be wrong. We need to accept that. We also come, what makes democracy work is you have a lot of different people from different backgrounds with different ideas who are thrown together and yes, you fight. You, you have to. I mean, you're, you're in, these are things you care about very deeply. And so you're going to argue and you're going to get angry when someone comes against you in your closest beliefs. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that you hate the other person. And that doesn't mean that you turn it into some sort of vendetta. That just means that you're different. But when you do that, that's how you get really good decisions. Because nobody's left out. That's how you get government that works for all the people, is if everybody has a say. When you get into this partisanship, and it, it was the most discouraging thing I've ever experienced in politics the last few years. When I was in office in the 80s, you could talk to the people you were serving with about a piece of legislation and just discuss what it would do to people. Mm -hmm the impact it would have on their lives. And you could get their vote if you could convince them that it would do a good thing. They would change their vote based on that. When I came back up here, especially the last two or three years, they don't care. They, the one argument you can never make that will have any impact is how it's going to affect people because they don't care. All they care about is getting each other. All they care about is getting power and keeping power. All they care about is the, the Republican Party versus the Democratic Party and the power. Now, when it gets down to that point, that's really bad government and it's really destructive to the people who are in office. And, and I look at them and I feel sorry for them because I keep thinking you're wasting this time you have when you could be doing so much good, you're throwing it away. And you're never going to get it back. I mean, you may do other things, but you're never going to get this chance to do this good ever again. And you need to do it while you can. But you talk about, I mean, I might as well be talking to that thing as, as <laughs> my colleagues. And it's gotten better this year. And leadership really matters. Yeah. 
who the leader is really matters. And if you have someone who's, uh, people just, it, it just kind of amazes me that I'm old enough now, I've seen it over and over again, people just adapt the attitudes of their leader. And uh, so I'm, I'm glad we had a change in leadership. I think this is a much better situation. I hope it does better as time goes by. There hasn't been a woman speaker, has there? No. Yeah. No. There should be, too, I think. I think that we need to, as I, I've said what I think, which is that you, I don't know if I made it clear, we need both men and women, mm -hmm. not one or the other. Mm -hmm. And that goes for what I was saying about the Democratic Party and pro-life. We, we, I'm not trying to run pro-choice people out of the party. I think they raise valid issues. It, it, I'm not afraid at all to discuss this with anyone. We just need to make it where people can follow their own conscience. Do you think this change in attitude came with term limits, or was it? Term limits has been very destructive. Limits? Term limits has been extremely destructive because it um, eliminated anybody who knows what they're doing. This is an extremely complex job, and to I, I don't understand why people think that running a government is something that you always want a, a neophyte doing. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, my feeling about term limits is that voters could kick you out any time they wanted to, and that's the way it should be. But uh, what we've done with term limits is we've created a situation where we constantly have these people who are just totally green, and so many of them think they were anointed, not elected, and they, I mean, they, they're just arrogant and. Uh, I, I realized after a while, part of their arrogance is because they don't know what they're doing and they're scared somebody's going to figure it out. And so they, they act arrogant to cover that. But uh, no, term limits is very destructive. Any way to reverse that? The vote of the people would be, I, I suppose someone could bring a court case. Uh, that's what happened on the federal level. The mm -hmm. Supreme Court ruled that, and they saved the country, in my opinion, by ruling against term limits on the federal level. I mean, we don't need a revolving door with our Congress. And um, as I said before, you, you just we need uh, probably reforms to try to eliminate money having so much power in elections. But uh, we don't need term limits. That's not an effective or good reform. Let's back up a little bit. When you said you left the first time, you got married to a fellow. I got married in 83. Was he, was he uh, in the House or Senate? He was in the House. At that time, too? Yeah. Have others done that? Do you know of? Twyla Gray did that. Uh, Twyla, uh, Representative Twyla Gray, she's now judge, district judge, and Representative Charles Gray married. And... Uh, uh -huh. As I, she left the legislature and then uh, ultimately ended up a district judge, and he left for a while and then came back and ran for office again and served. But they, yeah, they, those are the only two I know of, besides us. Well, when you two did, you have to change, move one of you had to move. In? Well, he was out of office at that time. Uh, Twyla and Charlie got, a, I think, a Supreme Court decision or an Attorney General's decision, one or the other, saying that they could live in their respective House districts. But then Charlie left, and I think he did that partly to clarify that for her. Um, but no, we've never had to deal with that at all. I think that would be pretty complex. Are you boys interested in politics? They're interested, but I don't know that they're interested in running. They are, they certainly have opinions <laughs> about it. It's discussed around the dinner table? Uh, not too much. I, I don't talk about it a lot. I, 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 I do, I talk endlessly to my husband, but I don't really talk to my kids. I, I try not to bring it home. And um, I'm kind of two people. When I'm up here, I'm Representative Hamilton. I tell people when I get out of that car in the parking lot. It's not just I'm Representative Hamilton. I'm District 89 when I get out of that parking lot. When I, when I step out of that car, I am the people of District 89. And there are a lot of things sometimes that I fight about that I wouldn't fight about if it was just me. But when somebody pushes me around up here, they're pushing them around. 
so I have to. At home, I'm just mom. And I don't have to do any of that. <laughs> close enough for you to live at home. Yeah, I just live about 10, 12 miles from yeah. the capital. Yeah. Has it been difficult managing family with? No, because my kids were older and my husband, as a former house member, knew. Mm -hmm. and, but no, I can't say that I've had any trouble at all managing it. Uh, the truth of the matter is, if my family needed me, I'd be out here mm -hmm. tomorrow. So describe a typical day. How early do you get here? And well, when, when we're in session, I, I'm not a person who gets up early and comes rushing out to the Capitol. Some of these guys get out here at 5.30 or 6 in the morning, but well, they're farm boys and that's how they, they always get up early. Well, I'm a city girl, so I, <laughs> I sleep in. I, uh, I tend to um, get here, it depends entirely on what I have. If I have an appointment, I come for the appointment. If I have a committee meeting, I come for the committee meeting. If we're in, if I don't have anything, I just, you know, sometimes we come into session early and we stay. I don't come until I need to. I, I, I can do most of my business thanks to computers and the phone and email. I can do a tremendous, I can run this office from my house and do. Uh, I, but I get out here when I need to be out here and I go to whatever I need to do. And um, it's very hard to describe. There isn't a typical day in the legislature. Every day is different, That's what I'm learning. Which, is, which is what makes it fun. Sure. Sure. There are a lot of things about this job that boredom is not usually a problem. Well, have you chaired committees? Oh, yes. Yeah, particular ones. Well, in the 80s, I chaired the health committee, which was a huge omnibus committee at that time. And then when I came back, uh, Speaker Adair uh, offered me the chairmanship of Commerce, Industry, and Labor, and I chaired that for two years. So I, I chaired those two committees. And um, they're both, uh, the health committee was more challenging because it got, it was much bigger, much bigger committee. Did that to travel much with, with the job? Uh, I could, I don't. I don't. I do occasionally, but very seldom. I just don't ask for travel. So, are you campaigning this summer then? No, I was. Uh, I didn't get an opponent, so I don't have to campaign, which I'm glad about. Does that happen very often, huh? Uh, well, it happened in uh, 2004, and then I had an opponent in 2006, so maybe it's every other time. I don't know. <laughs> well, I'm sure it Cost-wise, it's probably changed quite a bit from the 80s. A little bit. Uh, I was surprised at, when I was reelected in 2002, I only spent $5,000. And my opponent spent over 100000 So um, it, it varies. This last time I spent about 26000 on my race in 2006, which isn't too far off from what I spent in the 80s, actually. The computer does make it, uh, it the, the big change is postage is a lot more expensive, a lot more expensive. However, uh, the computer makes it possible to do a lot of other things a lot cheaper. And so it kind of, yeah, it's more expensive, but I don't do one of these big races where you go on the uh, television and stuff like that. That's where it gets outlandish very quickly. I, I actually don't know how some of these people spend all the money they spend. I don't know what they're doing. Uh, they're not doing what I do. Well, in the, it's inside the city, it's easier just to walk and knock on doors, I guess, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I do that, and I, I design all my own mailings. I have a big printer, and I print a lot of my own mailings. I uh, The printer that I use is my commercial printer is very reasonable. I... Um, I just do a lot of things myself, and that saves a, a large amount of money. And I don't pay anybody. I don't pay, uh, if somebody's working for me, they're a volunteer, and putting up yard signs or whatever. Well, on the floor, where's your seat this, this time around? I was right behind the, how, the Democratic floor leader on the, it was the second, it was one back from the front. You've been in the back row before? Yeah, I like it back there actually. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have so much seniority compared to everyone else. Uh, I, I could pretty well sit 
except for the speaker's desk or something, I can sit wherever I want. And I, I have been debating, do I want to go back to the back row or do I want to, there are advantages to both. In the back row, the television cameras can't get you. And so you can slouch or pick your nose or whatever you want to do. And, and on the, in the front, the television, they're on you all the time. And, and I tend to forget it. And I've been very fortunate. They haven't put me on television saying, you know, here she is drooling or whatever. But, you know, it, it, I'm sure I look pretty goofy sometimes because anybody does when they sit someplace for 12 hours. But um, the, the nice thing about being in the front is you have access to the chair. You have access to the floor leader. You have access to all these people. With, and when you're working legislation, that really is nice. And so I don't know. I haven't made up my mind where I want to sit. Now, that's one I don't. I, I'll leave it at the back of the front. <laughs> I don't know which one. <laughs> Are you going to count your previous years as into your seniority yeah. years? Yeah. Well? Yeah, I've got more seniority than anybody in either hand. All, you know, I'm number one in seniority. Mm -hmm. Then you get to pick your seatmate as well, or mm -hmm. you, you pick their spot, your spot, and then they pick whoever. Well, I haven't. Uh, it's a mutual thing. You don't just say, "Well, you've got to be my seatmate." Uh, and I don't know. My seatmate is terming out this time. Uh, D Representative Daryl Gilbert. I was very. We got along really well. Had a good time together. And before that, my seatmate was Ray Miller. Like for two years, for two terms, four years, we sat together, and I was. Um, I enjoy both of them. It's uh, your seatmate's important because you sit there and talk about stuff, and and so it's important you have a seatmate that you like. But I I haven't really thought about that. Uh, we'll decide that after the election in November. So the very last day of session, is there any particular traditions that go on? Oh, there's a lot of uh, the last day of session is always a Chinese fire drill. We're we're trying to pass bills, and we just have the very last minute to do it, and. And they, it's complicated passing a bill under any circumstances, but it especially is the last day because you have to pass it through the House. Let's say it's a House bill. You have to pass it through the House, then you've got to get it engrossed, get it through that process, get it over to the Senate, get it called up, get them to vote on it. And if there's, and it may have to come back to the House, you never know. And so if anything goes, you, you can lose bills in a heartbeat that last day. And if you're not really on it, you will. And I just hate having bills come up on the last day because the pressure is so extreme trying to get them through. If it's a Senate bill, it's the reverse. They've got to get it heard. They've got to get it to you. You've got to get it heard. And there's so many people you've got to get to agree to, to get it through that last day. And they're tired and they're, they're, I mean, they're really worn out. And everybody's on top of everybody else. And um, so it, it's a very, very complex thing the last day. Um, by the time we get to actual sine die, we're, uh, most of the fight's been beaten out of us. And we're, <laughs> we're just really glad that we're able to yell sine die and go out. But that part's kind of fun. You actually yell it? Yeah. And we usually yell, and and we we tend to used to when we had a lot of paper on the floor when we before we went to computers when we printed the bills out we'd throw it all up in the air and that sort of thing. Uh, the um, when session's over, it's kind of like being thrown off a horse because it's just pandemonium and you're working extremely long hours. You basically you don't even get enough sleep. You spend all your time up here the last few weeks and if you're not up here you're still fussing about it and you can't you go home and dream about it because it's so intense and and then you it's just over I mean over and it takes two or three days to get halfway normal again and and that's if you're a pretty fast adapter and uh, because I mean, it, when it stops, it is so sudden and so complete, there's almost a feeling of amputation. I mean, it just, I mean, all of a sudden there's, huh. And so there is an adaption every time you sign your die. Does some, some wait for that day just to do, to present their bill on that day? Or? Nobody wants to no. present their bill on that day. 
they it's just becoming. it just happens to you. I've never heard anybody say, boy, I'd love to present my bill on the last day. <laughs> well, I suppose if you're if you're someone who is um, the speaker or someone like that, and I'm not saying that the speaker does this, but if you were in that position, you would have control of the process. And so you could. But even the speaker has, or, or let's say you're the pro tempore of the Senate, it doesn't matter whichever one, you only have control of one body. And and then, of course, nobody controls the governor. And it takes all three to make a law. So you, the, the further back you do it, the better, the more time you have to correct mistakes. And that's important. Become a world class negotiator and I'm willing to do it. Probably get close to your time, won't we? Mm, probably. Do you have any others? Have any my, other last, my last question is, when history is written about you, what would you like for it to say? Oh, I don't care. I'll be dead. <laughs> I don't care what it says. Uh, I just want to do the best I can now. Okay. Well, that's it for me. Anything else you want to say? Anything I need to ask that I didn't? No, I don't think so. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.